Shalmaters. I am the uh, digital learning coach for Union County and today we're going to be doing a uh, look at a self-paced classroom. And so this is going to be mainly a focus on math. Um, I actually did potentially parts of this with my social studies class just with a little modification. I'll try to point that out as I go. But this is kind of keeping a math class in mind the whole time. Um, like I said, anything I talk about here, you can easily adapt to other subjects. It's just this is where my focus was when I did this. So, very first thing, I am Sean Winters. I am a digital learning coach for Union County. Um, please reach out to me if you have any additional questions. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, um, do check out my YouTube channel. There's ever-growing resources there. I'm constantly making videos to kind of get things going. So, let us start off and get this rolling. The very first thing we want to do is actually look at your assessments. And just like when you're planning out your curriculum, start with what you want to assess first and then kind of work backwards. We're going to do the same thing for a self-paced classroom. Look at your assessment and look at your key components about what you want to build. What items are crucial? What... Uh, pieces are required to build on to later things and what are some variations what are different teaching methods that you want to show more than one model of it or uh, what type of scenario might get added in that could make it a little bit different and so when we do this we're thinking all right i'm going to do a flip style classroom as well. So I'm going to kind of be pre-recording, pre-planning, pre-writing um, my lesson things that I want my students to go through. And so that's going to be a big thing. Plan your lessons. What needs to be taught? How are you going to reach your students? How are you going to assess your students? So first thing I like to do is start with um, videos and think, okay, this is what I would normally stand up in front of my class and teach. And you know, when I'm up in front of a class, it might take me 40 minutes to talk about this because I'm asking questions. I'm waiting for my students to respond. I'm giving them another variation. We're taking turns back and forth. I very much use the um, I do, we do, you do model on things. And so with videos, you think, well, I don't have students who are going to be immediately asking questions. I can tell them to do something and pause the video, but I don't actually have to do that wait time. So those 40 minute lessons quickly get shortened down. And I think, all right, what are the crucial things I need to really hit on? And I keep my videos a little smaller. And so I'll go ahead and uh, play this one video. Uh, this will kind of showcase uh, what I'm talking about when I do my videos. I'm not gonna do the full thing. I'll even kind of fast forward through pieces. So for this, the audio is very low, but I just started with a general slideshow. I'm actually using um, SmartBoard to do this. And so I'm recording myself talking while going over the problem. And so this allows me to do circle and everything else, but you could already have pre-planned slides where you reveal things or move shapes in, or if you're using something like Jamboards or something, you can easily write and do the same thing. And so I just go through and teach. It teaches if my classroom is there and teaches if my students are sitting there watching me. But anytime I pause for think time, I don't have to pause as long. I can move on because my students have the ability to pause for as long as they need. I would recommend frequent reminders that they have the ability to do that. Um, not only that, I still ask my students to practice different things. So at the end of this, typically, I don't know for sure on this one if I do or not. Usually I'll end with some uh, practice problems I want my students to do. So I'll ask them to go ahead and uh, do three or four problems, bring it in for class. I've always asked them to take notes over the videos. So that's for their own benefit. That's not for me. I, it doesn't help me at all that they took notes. That's for them. After they've watched the video, I'll post an assignment. And we'll talk about posting on Google Classroom here in a little bit. But I'll post an assignment. And that assignment could be a practice worksheet. It could just be something pulled from their textbook or tell them through problems one through four from their textbook, just like what I probably would have done in class normally. I might have a variant assignment where I'm like, all right, I want you to go to this website. I want you to complete this task that they have going on this website. 
there's a, a bunch of different options for that. So once they do a lesson and then they do a practice, they might do another lesson and another practice, another lesson, another practice. It, that'll lead to assessing. So what I tend to do is a lesson, practice, lesson, practice, then quiz. Quizzing is really important on this. Since your students are traveling at a self pace, you need to make sure they're moving on when they need to move on, not when they think they need to move on. So we need to take times and quiz. And I do frequent quiz. Now my quizzes can't be one question. If a kid gets that wrong and they got a 0%, that's not a good representation. So five is really kind of pushing it, but you don't want them doing quizzes so much that it's wasting a lot of their time. You're just trying to figure out what they know. So I'd create a little quiz and I usually use Usually, I always use Google Forms for this. And I'd ask the period and go ahead and have the students ask their names and so forth. And then they'd go through and they'd take the quiz. And I'll go through some of the settings I'd do for the quizzes on here, but I'd go ahead and have them answer each question. And then when they submit it, I have it where I never limited the responses because I always went off the first timestamp. And sometimes a student would, uh, I'd tell them they are welcome to retake it. However, I'm taking the first score. Uh, and I always remind them, don't take a quiz or an assessment until you're for sure ready, because I don't want that affecting your grade. I want you to do it when you're ready. I collect their email, and that's the big thing for that whole, making sure the student is who they say they are, because I collect their email, so they have to be signed in as their account, and then I also ask their name. It's just kind of a double thing. I shuffle the question order because this is self-paced, I might have kids taking the same quiz at the same time. I don't want them having the same question sitting right side by side. So the shuffling can help that. I always had them record their scores, so they are responsible for journal collection of their uh, own performance. And with the quizzes, I have them say, which questions did you miss? Which ones did you get correct? Their point, I want them to know, and I have that set for immediate. So the moment they finish a quiz, they know what they got. They get, they get that tangible right then, right in that moment score. And so once they get that, they have the ability to have that feedback given to them. And this is where it gets important. If they set up a certain percentage, if you don't want them moving on unless they get an 80%, then you can come over here to presentation and say, if you scored below 80, I want you to do this assignment. And so you add an additional assignment. And the very important thing is before a kid takes a quiz, you have to have them have the openness in the classroom. I didn't allow them to do quizzes or tests at home. They always had to do it in the classroom. And then if they score poor, they tell you they're going to be doing that other assignment. You go on Google Classroom and you open that other assignment form. I already had it pre-drafted. I just don't have this class, the student selected who's getting that. If they're ready to move on, you say, okay, you're good and they move on. And so that allows them to go through and move on to the next topic when they're ready to move on to the next topic. So utilizing Google Classroom is going to be essential here. Uh, it is a really good platform for doing something like this. And so a couple of tricks for you and we'll actually get into Google Classroom and go ahead and build something up. Uh, Assignments number these things. That helps keep the organization for your students. And you, you know in Google Classroom, sometimes it can be harder to find where you need to be at. Um, if I just say this is page 414, that's not going to help my students. But if it's number 13 and number 14 and number 15, that helps them keep track. And then constantly remind them, submit your stuff. I don't care if you turn it in late because it's self-paced. Just make sure it gets turned in. And then create a help desk topic. Now, this isn't something I uh, did in my class, but I really wish I had done. So let's jump over to Google Classroom. So I have this blank classroom, and the very first thing is I'm going to create a uh, assignment, and it is going to be assignment number. Let's say we're already up to number 27. And this, you can say what it's talking about. Uh, volume. Watch video. And this is going to be the first video assignment. And so then 
you can set whatever point value you want for your videos. This is just them watching them. You can set it as a ungraded. Uh, I require them to watch videos, but I can't really assess them fully on their video. Just that's a participation grade otherwise. So I don't really worry too much about it. Topic, I want to create a topic and this is 3D figures is where I'm at. I'll go into much more detail on all of this. Um, so the next thing I want to do is actually add a YouTube link. And so this is where I would actually upload one of my videos, but you can pull other things that you know are in existence out there. And so I'm just going to grab a Khan Academy. Khan, great resource to pull from. So they have to watch this video. I'm going to go ahead and add in, take notes, and do practice. So we're going to assign that. And then that's problem number tw assignment number 27. And then I'm going to follow it up immediately with problem number 28. And this is practice for volume. And we'll say do page 414, number one through three. And then also number 24, 23. So you'll add them to that assignment. And then we might even have a worksheet that goes along with it. And if you want to upload a worksheet from your Google Drive or a file or a link to a website, you can always do that. So I have that added. I want to make sure my topic is still going to 3D figure. And I assign. And then typically what I would do is another video, another practice problem, and then we would follow it up with a quiz. And so I can do that multiple ways. So let's say I'm just now on problem uh, assignment number 33. Depending on how many practice problems, I go into my Google Drive. And if I already have a quiz ready, and it doesn't matter if it's multiple classes. I, uh, on the start of my quizzes, you'll notice I did period one, three, four. I can filter those out using filter tools on the Excel. So I don't mind that they're all kind of mixed together. So type in volume quiz, find your quiz, and upload. I might not actually have one that's named. Just, oh, actually, I should. Insert it. I want to grade import. I can even lock my Chromebook mode so they can't do those extra research. And then I'll turn around and I assign. Now, something I didn't do on the assignments was turn around and do, oop, forgot to do the topic. I love that it throws it up there because that helps remind me. So I add that topic in. Um, I didn't play around with the points value. That's up to you on your classroom on what you get points on. You might not do any points on the practice or the volume, but then turn around and do all your points on the quiz. That's really up to you. Just once again, be very transparent with your students. Let them know like, hey, this is, the quizzes are worth a lot. So be aware of that. Once I do so many of these, we'll have the assessment. But once again, during class, I would do. Now I talked about doing a uh, topic on here that was called help desk. And this is something I wish I had done in the classroom. And all I would do here is create a Google form. And I would ask simple questions like, who are you? What period? What topic are you on? And then And just let them type out, like, I, I'm struggling with this. Da, 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 da. But then when I get to the responses, I'll go over here to tools and go to notification rules. And every time there was a uh, form submitted, I would get an email. And that way I know one of my students was struggling with something. 
Any changes we made. I want to set that to right away. Anytime one of my students would be struggling with something, I would know, hey, this student's needing help with this. I can turn around and engage with them. So they're having trouble with this. And it could be after hours of school. I don't notice that, and depending on how you want to function like that, you get on Google Classroom and shoot a message to the student and be like, hey, I saw that you're struggling with this. How can I help? Would you like to set up a Google Meet? Uh, I can help you first thing in the morning before school starts. At, we'll set up time after school, or I'll catch you during class. Just however you want, but that will let you have that extra little communication. You know, might notice like, Tim, Tim has really been struggling with this, or it might be like every time right before a quiz, I notice Stephanie's having trouble. This might just be a confidence thing for Stephanie, and she just needs that reinforcement that she's doing well on this. So under help desk, I would just add that, um, I'd add that link to uh, that quiz I just created, that form, and let them know. I didn't name it, so it would just be unreasonable, but let them know that's there, and they can just go back and read, fill that in. Anytime they're struggling, this is your help form. And so it's just a nice little digital way of having them get that extra little help. So that is uh, kind of your Google Classroom. Like I said, you can get into the grading of it and everything else. Right. This is self-paced, but I I deal with students. I deal with children. And so due dates are still a real thing in life, and we need to reinforce those with our students. And I can say this is self-paced. There's no way I can allow my students not to do anything in the idea that they can catch up later. That's not how I view self-paced as working. Real benefit to self-paced is a student can get ahead. And they can spend more time on the things that struggle with and less time on the things they didn't. Part of the issue in the classroom is you're getting asked a bunch of questions, which is great, but there's students who are ready to move on and you're holding them back. And so letting them go ahead and go forward. And if they hit a part where they're stuck, well, if they're four assignments ahead, they can be stuck for three days working things out, getting help as they need and spend that extra time where previously we would have been like, no, it's time to move on, we gotta move on, and that's not fair to the student. So, I set up this method, and this worked really well. And so I, you could potentially post this and just keep changing this in Google Classroom so the students are aware. You can make this as uh, just announcements to the class, but I had this on my classroom board. I had the assignments written out, and I had um, little magnets next to it that had the red, yellow, and the green. So, Red is a hard due date on an assignment. This has to be turned in. Otherwise, I am going to start docking you points for this. But this is also, if I have a student at this red, that's my intervention kid. That's the kid who really, really struggling. I need to be working with. And it could be just they're terrible about time management, or it could be they were really struggling with something. So any kid close to this assignment, I really make sure I talk to them about once again, I numbered the assignment. Now, for my benefit, I would always add in like the standard in front of it. And that just kind of helped me keep track of like how many standards I, oh, sorry, how many lessons I had for each standard. Not every standard gets the same weighting. So just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, yellow is just kind of that little warning like, hey, you're kind of close to this. No, you're not, not really worried, but keep that in mind. And then just that reminder, don't fall behind. It's really easy to be like, oh, I can't, I'll go catch up. And then something happens and you get pulled back a little bit. So once again, this is still my intervention group. And then green, you're on pace. So when I say on pace, this is where I would say like in, on general, on September 14th, this is what I would normally be teaching in a classroom. So this is the lesson I would normally teach that day. I just expect my kids to be a little farther along. And so that kind of helps them kind of keep that in mind. Like, this is what I would normally teach. So this is like a day behind. This is like two days behind. So this is an issue. If students aren't here, but like I said, this is where interventions are taking place and you know, still helping students as they need help, but you're shooting for this. Now, something to give an option to a kid. What benefit do they have of 
trying to actually accelerate themselves, work farther ahead. Um, I told my students, you know, if you're four days ahead, there's a couple extra options for you. Um, like I said, you can do a couple of bonus things, and this is typically up to you, and you can design this however you want. So uh, you can have alternate assignments. Um, some people call these sandbox assignments where students are kind of working on some additional things. You can have them build a new study tool or applying something they just learned, demonstrating it, making a poster, doing something different, a little more creative that they haven't got to do previously. Um, it's really hard to kind of do group work when with self-paced because you have to find a peer who's at that same pacing as you and there are some who kind of ride together the whole time they don't want to leave their friend behind but uh this is an option number two is probably the more catchy one that i saw more of my students do and that's stuff uh, finding like interactive tools well my favorite one was prodigy math and my students were four days ahead i said do prodigy math they're still doing math they're getting that reinforcement. It's not always the way I would have them getting reinforcement in the classroom, but it is an option and it does work well for them. And it's did some math. The other thing is, if you're ahead, teach a peer. I don't need a kid who's falling behind to be trying trying to mess with their peers. But if I have a kid who's farther ahead and they're like, you know, I don't really want to uh, work on this next assignment yet. Is it? Can I just go around to help people? If they've been pulling the grades and demonstrating they know the material, yes, they can go around and help. Keep an eye on them, listen to kind of what they're saying, make sure they're not just giving answers, and but they're truly helping and they're helping appropriately, then that is great and that helps reinforce them because if they're able to teach it, then that's helping them learn it even more and reinforcing their own knowledge that they have. And it's a kind of a sense of pride. Now, if I've got 20 kids who are farther ahead, I might just adjust my due dates a little bit to kind of decrease the number, but I'd also limit the number of kids who get to do that for that day. And it might be just rotating that, like, hey, for this 10 minutes, it's this kid, but for the next 10 minutes, it'll be that kid. Um, I know some teachers who are like, I, I'm not gonna let them just sit there and read if they're ahead. But that's fine, that's up to you. But then the kids showing they can do the material they're farther ahead, Give them a little break time. It might not be let them read the entire period, but say, hey, you know what? You're ahead. Do you have any other subject you need to work on right now? And, you know, it goes a lot to say that a teacher is willing to help them. If I'm the math teacher, I'm willing to help them with their reading homework during that time as well. That goes a long, a long way to say I value that um, topic as well and also value you. So just kind of keep that kind of stuff in mind for that social well-being of your students. So looking at this, we broke down a lesson, we created an instructional video, we uh, figured out a way of reinforcing what we created, we're assessing as we go, uh, students all are following their routines, and then finally we're going to be assessing. Quizzes and tests have to be done in the classroom. Don't trust your kids to do those at home. You never know, no matter what safeguards you put, if they're clever, they're going to find a way. So I would never allow them to quiz and test outside. So always keep quizzes and tests. Uh, unassigned until they say they're ready for it. I just have it noted that they're there and then I actually truly assign them to the students when they're ready. Once they're ready to move on, they go to their next topic. If you've hit your entire school year, if I'm teaching uh, sixth grade math and they've covered all my topics, I move into seventh grade math. I grab, the, I talk to the seventh grade teacher and I ask like, what's your first units? And I, I go through there. I never got past their first full unit. Um, it's potential it could happen, but I never had to worry about that. So class time. Uh, big thing on here is I'm still teaching. I'm just teaching in a different way. And sometimes you'll catch wind of that, but some people are like, well, they're, they're doing this flip classroom and self-paced so they don't have, you're very much still teaching. I interacted more with my students doing this than I had ever done before. And that's because of the way um, things are kind of set up. Uh, Warm-up activities are how I always started the class. We went through and we did practice problems and everything else. And then I did a quick mini lesson. Whatever topic I'd normally be teaching that day, I still taught a lesson on that. But I was done in less than 10 minutes. So they've got the videos for that. This is just the way of just kind of engaging the class and us talking about it. And a kid might have done this two weeks ago. A kid might just be on it today. 
you shouldn't have anybody behind because that's that pacing thing. You don't want anyone who's behind that. Go over your expectations. Always go over your expectations. I expect you to use headphones. I expect you to be working solo. I expect you to be on the right topic. It's very much a digital activity most of the time. So I expect you to be where you need to be. But immediately, I mean, after 15 minutes at most, the rest of the time is devoted to your students asking questions to you and you giving help. Think about that. They're, like, they're ready to move on and you're just spending the whole time helping. Now, it might sound very intimidating, like Tim is on this topic and Billy's on this. You'll, you'll know you know your curriculum. When a student asks a question, it doesn't matter if they ran into you at Walmart and asked a question. You know the topics. It's not that bad to help them out. Keep your directions very clear and they'll be fine. It, it actually works out really well, but you get a lot more time of just going around helping kids as they need help. And then, like I said uh, earlier, it's very hard for kids to actually find time to like partner up. So you might tell them, hey, tomorrow we're going to have a little partnering activity to give them that time to actually social in there. So we're not going to have as much class time tomorrow to just work on your self pace. But always close with something. Pull them back together, ask something relevant, an old lesson, spiraling things in. And that's something I didn't mention earlier. I think I have it on a slide somewhere, but I always would, in the practice activity, spiral old lessons in. Let them review old material, throw in a couple of problems from something they've done in the past, and let keep it fresh, keep them working, but then also these warm-up activities do that as well. A couple of additional options that you have when doing your class in an interactive textbook, just think of a really big hyperdoc. So if I'm talking about uh, two-dimensional figures, I might take a Word document and actually build my own little textbook, throwing in links to videos, links to the worksheets I'm going to use, little practice problem, links to other websites, uh, references. I might have a text, another textbook in the classroom that'll say, hey, you might want to go look at this book. But build up a bunch of resources for that and have that available to the students to help control and navigate your classroom. If the idea of just a full open-ended class scares you, you can do this weekly. You can say, all right, for this week, these are the uh, potential assignments you have. You can work ahead. If you get done early, here, just do the bonus of the activities, a little sandbox activities. You can do it bi-weekly if you want to push. Real benefit to self-paced is your really high kids can really excel at this. They can go really far. When you put limitations on this, you kind of hinder them a little bit. So just keep that in mind and be prepared to have something for those kids who are just going to blow this stuff out of the water and go really far ahead. But that is what I have for you guys. Um, I know I didn't really go into like how to make videos and that kind of stuff. It's really up to you. Screencastify is great. If you're a different topic than math, this is still 100% applicable. I did this with social studies. I did a lot more text reading. I did a lot more like crash course videos into a topic. Um, but you could do a simple podcast of you reading uh, a little excerpt from the topic in history. But that is really up to you on how you do it. But you can see the potential where I just pre-teach my lesson, give them something to reinforce it, let them have another lesson, reinforce it, and then quiz. Those quizzes are so essential because that's letting you know, all right, are my kids grasping the material? Are they ready to move on? And it's essential for them to recognize, okay, I want to take a quiz. This is important. I can't move on unless I get this right. So I might want to go back and review. So they're purposely taking time to review. You won't have very many students who are like, oh, I'm just going to try it and see what happens because that ends up making more work for them. Because if they do well, they get to move on. If they don't, they view it as, oh, I've got another assignment. We know why they're getting that other assignment. It's to help them out. But sometimes they don't recognize that. If you need anything, don't hesitate to ask. And uh, thank you all for your time.